Welcome everyone to another episode of the Shaman's Way podcast. As always, this episode comes from the teachings of our amazing friend and shaman in residence, Cricket. We hope you're enjoying these podcasts as much as we enjoy making them, and I'd like to take just a moment to ask you if you would please leave us a rating and a comment in iTunes or whichever podcast player you're listening to us from. Giving us a rating and sharing this podcast with others is the biggest way you can tell us that you like our show. Now, without further ado, on with the episode. Well, hello to my constant listeners, and hello to my semi-constant listeners, and a very special hello to my brand new listeners. I wanted to start our precious time together with song rattle as a means of cleaning and clearing my mind. It has been, from my perspective, a very intense and a precipice of such possible change and hope. I would like to engage with song and sound as a way of releasing the attention that it has so that I may be in sacred space and give my words and my full attention to you, my listeners, for the very simple reason that that is the very least that I can do. No my oh hey no my oh hey no my oh hey oh no my oh hey no my oh hey no my oh hey oh hey oh hey oh no my oh hey no my oh hey no my Saying that, that, I want to address the political, the emotional, the spiritual, the intellectual uprising and awakening that has caught fire in this world. I don't feel prepared to do so today. Instead, what I would like to do is give myself some time and space to ponder the huge changes that could be before us and I want to do some journey work to see where the spirits will take me and return to you at another time in another place and share my insights and my thoughts. So for you my constant listener this part of this particular podcast together may seem somewhat old because you know so many things. I want to take us back to a beginning of concept, to a beginning of self. How can a culture so far removed from its ancestral roots reestablish a connection with that great tree of life or the song or the spirit that unites us all? In neo-shamanism, the answer for this, or part of the answer, lies in developing a close reciprocal relationship with one's power animals, spirit kin, helping spirits. This concept is of, well, it's central, right? It is central to the responsible practice of shamanism or an aspect of shamanism, also primarily to animism. When we talk about it, we talk about it often in generic terms, and it's underexplained in popular culture. I know you have heard me, especially you, my constant listener, and probably even you, my semi-constant listener. I have certainly talked about the use of the word shaman, and in this popular culture, you know, I 
we now have memes which travel around the internet and even in our media and the television shows and so on and so forth. We hear this and this is my spirit animal. Oh, you know, the grumpy cat is my spirit animal or this ice cream is my spirit animal. And that, you know, seriously drives me out of my ever-loving mind. Uh, but I'm gonna just going to pull that back because there's there is a challenge in me to certainly recognize this has been my path, my intention, and I have attempted to create a, a deep understanding of the world which I inhabit. And then the semi-liminal, semi-conscious relationship to the concept of not only spirit, but animal to many humans who live in this world with us who rarely would have put those two concepts together. I recognize that my frustration isn't born out of disdain for their idea, but rather impatience for their lack of understanding of the sacredness of those words. Power, animals, spirit, kin, helper, and spirits, they, in a loose way, I see them being recognized in the changing language we live in as archetypes. Interestingly enough, I bring this up because I have been taking a group of stalwart souls with me into a journey understanding the archetypes we have within ourselves recognizing and linking those archetypes to not only our own selves, but the collective unconscious, the many, many myths that have traveled through time with us, which point us towards standard function, standard beings, not standard in that, you know, horrible sense, but standard as in a skeletal structure of something. It does not surprise me. We also have the use of the word archetype referring to animal. If we really are practicing in this world of spirit and not just living in the brain, certainly that aspect of the animal as an archetype or your spirit kin as an archetype in the shaman mind makes absolute sense. Makes absolute sense. Archetypes are those primal energies they exist as entities in and of themselves, express themselves through human behavior and natural phenomena. These archetypes, they grow. I'll give you an example in my own world. Until I began to accept shamanism can indeed have the space to hold spirit kin as an archetype, I looked towards my relationship with lion. When Lion and I began traveling together, the form of Lion was smaller, different colored. It was different. Our relationship was different. It was far more playful. I, I still bear some pretty good scars on my back in the spirit world from rough and tumble with a lion. Over the years we worked together, Lion became and has become a solid companion. As I have experienced Lion, Lion has also grown in return. The widening of the chest, the darkening of the mane, the growing of the body, the scars upon the face and in the ribs from the many battles that we have taken on together in that aspect of the spirit can be coming and is the archetype absolutely makes sense from my perspective as an example. Archetype is an energy that exists outside of space and time. Hello, that would be the spirit world, right? And so it arises spontaneously through intention and awareness. When we journey, we are moving spontaneously, often I would hope you have some sort of intention of what you're journeying towards and it is incumbent upon us to keep a level of awareness. Mother and father energy, the anima, the animus, the creation, the destruction, the expansion and contraction and chaos and manifestation. We can use our minds to tap into the energy and relationship of archetypes. We let them guide us and we guide them. 
It's a relationship building. They can provide with a greater ease and comfort, and we have good spirit kin, good power animals, good guys, helping spirits in the spirit world when you're journeying. There is absolutely a greater ease and comfort, a safety, a sense of companionship. There is that ever-growing relationship. We can use our spiritual travels to tap into the more, what I would consider to be the more authentic or easily recognized creation or recognized expression of archetype. Power animals in your spirit can to let them guide you and create an ease and comfort. Archetypes can express themselves in many ways. Spirit can represent their own set of archetypes. Animal medicine speaks of the archetypal energies the animals carry in and of themselves. I have said before, and I will say it again, spirit often appears to us in shapes or form we can accept, we can understand and work with. Animal medicine that speaks to that archetype. Owl medicine is archetypal energy. The archetype animal, could there be, you know, when we work into the medicine wheel, we have the four animals that are in the medicine wheel for sun bear. We have the golden eagle, for me it's the deer. We have the coyote, for me it's the coyote and the and the mouse. In the west, we have Munchkiwis, we have the great bear. In the north, we have Waboon, we have the great buffalo, we have, you know, the four-legged. If we take it into a relational aspect, the archetype being an expression of spirit personified in this particular form, we could then, with the shaman's eye, we could then tap into that archetype of a direction or the archetype of the spirit that is housed within the great bear, the spirit that is housed within the coyote, the spirit that is all of those not just housed in, but certainly is. Owl medicine, for instance, describes energy steeped in careful watching, in wisdom. It is the personification. It is the archetype of the wise one, the watching one, the patient one, seen through illusion, seen deeply into lies and deception, so that deep seeing. Also, the medicine of the twilight. The twilight can be that space between the light and the dark, that transitional place, that time when the owl's eyes are awake, alert, active, the environments of some of the owls, not all the owls, owls have different habitats and different habits, but the point of the twilight medicine is the medicine of not just seeking balance, not being in balance, but seeing through the shadows of the light and the dark in order to pierce into what is seen and what is unseen. That is an archetype of wisdom because it taps into the mystery. It taps into the depth of intuition. It taps into oh so many things. In my own experience, as not only a person who has been practicing for a long time, who has had journeys and led groups through the years, when I find a new person, you know, those beautiful beginner eyes, I can't help but see the level of resistance. I mean, some people go, oh yeah, of course I have power animals. However, when you introduce it to a brand new person, the concept of working with an animal can be quite jarring, again, because I go back to the cut off from the natural world. So how would the natural world be a guide for me if I have absolutely no relationship to the natural world and therefore the natural world has no import to me? is not something of my soul and is not something of my own spoken self. When we do the shamanic journey, when we enter into that altered state of consciousness, when we dive into the theta waves, 
we're looking for, especially in neo-shamanism, receiving healing. We want to come to find some answers to some of the biggest questions. And it's really sexy to our culture that is obsessed with quick self-help remedies, being asked to take the time to locate and form an alliance with a non-corporeal energy form is met with, get a load of this, skepticism. Yes, you heard me right, skepticism. <gasps> Away with that skepticism. I just flicked my fingers, you know, like a peachnut to the front of the head and gone is that word skepticism. However, just because I can peach nut it away doesn't mean the average person can peach nut it away. And that's where the fun begins, but that's a whole other story. To suspend that skepticism requires, at minimum, an often unanticipated suspension in disbelief. Ooh, did you like that? Unanticipated suspension of disbelief to consciously jump into the experience of non-ordinary reality vis-a-vis -vis the altered state of consciousness brought about by the super awesome drum did we do rattle anything of that sort of sonic and or driven sense of sound we are asked to create this form of relationship how do we do that we consciously jump into the experience of this particular reality we're experiencing. But it requires the person who is experiencing, especially with beginner eyes, begins a lengthy process of confronting and then letting go of a deep set of cultural programming. We have an overculture. We've talked about the overculture before. I've talked about some of the evils of, and I'm just using that word today for fun, kind of, uh, the evils of the overculture and how we are programmed in many ways by the images, the sights, the sounds, the voices, everything that comes into our world and we process it, that becomes that social overculture. The individual parts are a whole other story. You know, I'm going off on a tangent, so I'm going to stop myself right now, and I'm going to right back to the beginning. Not the whole beginning of this talk, but just the beginning of this thought process. <laughs> Trust me, I'm getting there. The programming, so this programming we have, it tells us that those power animals, those spirit kin, those helping spirits, they only exist in the realm of ghost stories, myths, legends, and that fanciful imagination of children and artists. Hmm, artists. If they do exist, then they do so in a third world native context far removed from the sophistication of the modern world. And so begins the jarring process of reconnecting with one's ancient roots. And I have seen enough people, pardon me, I'm going to swear, mind fucked by the experiences they've had in the journey. I have seen so many faces gobsmacked when they come out of a journey. It's always a pleasure and a delight, number one, that they had an experience. That's really, for me, just like, yeah, they did it. Second of all, that they got gobsmacked because sometimes I think if you have beginner eyes and you get a god shot in the very beginning, there's a stronger chance that you'll continue with it, but there's an equally strong chance that you'll run scared. But we're not talking about the scared people. We're going to talk about the beginners and the beginner eyes and that beautiful sense of soul that experiences for the first time. In order to get there, somehow, some way, we must dissolve the complex mind, those mental constructs, the compartmentalization we have formed around what is ordinary reality versus non-ordinary reality. And I've used those terms before, or 3D reality is what I refer to as the ordinary reality. And, you know, the spirit world is certainly the non-ordinary reality. But we have to recognize that these constructs, the overculture, they are so much a part of the composition of our consciousness, we cannot see them. 
much like the ideological functions on the level of collectives that we carry. We carry beliefs in our mind and those drive our behavior. How do we suspend those beliefs? These are good questions for right now in the uprising of the awakening of the spirit and the soul, the degradation of one human being for the benefit of another human being was never sanctioned by any spirit, by any being. But I digress. How can the mind and their behavior change? How can we suspend belief? What is belief? Is it a flexible, receptive brain in this state of altered state of consciousness, in this shamanic journey state? This is where we enter and where the brain is available to open to a great, huge, mysterious, omnipotent knowledge. That can really widen our expansion of self when we are not necessarily ourselves thinking of all the tasks we need to do or who we are, all those many hats. When we suspend, when we activate that active imagination, when we allow ourselves to accept or even give space to the possibility that there is something bigger beyond and something different and something awesome and sometimes frightening all at the same time. If we can do that where we are not necessarily ourselves, we can believe that we don't have to be all those people and we suspend belief in ourself. We suspend belief in ourself even for a while. We can be open to those cosmic, those ancient, those inherent wisdoms of the archetype. You didn't think I forgot that, did you? For those of us who are fully engaged in the process of reconnecting, remembering, and releasing, our connection to the spirit kin and our helping spirits mark the beginning of our path. And they mark it again and again and again because Things change. Spirits move. Spirits shift their appearance. Spirits do change. The longer the relationship is, it's like any other relationship. At first, we just begin to see the surface, and then through time, that surface becomes a little bit more depth and a little bit more depth and a little bit more depth. Without a strong relationship, or at least an earnest desire to form a strong relationship, the practice of neo-shamanism or core shamanism, it simply is not sustainable. Why? Because our spirit kin and our helping spirits serve us as our translators between the spirit world and our reality. They have the ability to move fluidly, fluidly, fluidly through the liminal space between the worlds. They have taught me how to stand with one foot in each world so that I can bring my medicine back and forth in a grounded way. And I mean that, bring my medicine back and forth. There are times when my medicine and my healing is required in the spirit world just as much as and as often as it is required in the middle world, in the physical world. It is that balance of bringing the medicine back and forth between that time and space, over here, over there, wherever that threshold is, through observing their behavior in my, in my journeys with them, I have learned so much, not only about the behavior of the animals, the rhythms of the nature of spirit world, which places in the spirit world are forever sunshine, which spaces in the spirit world are, how, do they, how are they uh, shown in the lower world, and which lower world is it. Also, as a side note, I do recognize the spirit world, much like our spirit can appear to us in forms that we're going to understand and going to be able to relate to. That being said, I'm going to come to another secondary point and say that even when you have a long-term relationship or a long-term movement with spirit, there are still times, every single time I journey is, there's always a, well, that was brand new. And that is, that is part of the sustainable relationship. The excitement is that 
nothing is ever the same. There's still that same skeletal structure to this world, to that world. However, the experience is contained within that structure. The essence of the building of that structure really does change. As we move through these worlds, as we move and deepen our relationship, we can let go of the spiritual weight that holds us, that no longer serves us, those preconceived notions that we can abandon now, those hang-ups that we had, we can abandon now. The power animals, the archetypes, they are the gatekeepers to the deeper truths that exist transpersonally in our collective unconscious. They exist outside of ourselves in the spirit world. Without a strong bond, the practice of entering into the spirit world, some people consider that a bit risky. I like to come into this place that is an anchor spot. I've talked about my anchor spot many times, especially you, constant listener, are going to roll your eyes if I go into what I perceive as the importance of the anchor spot. So, For the love of my constant listeners, I will not go into that story again today. Spanning the multiple layers of the spirit world, we have, you know, the great tree, the world tree, and I've dedicated much time talking about that. It is, you know, as much as there's the world tree, there's the cosmic mountain, there are different representations for the center of the spirit world, same as you are the representation of the spirit world. You are the world tree as much as that extension of the spirit world also has a world tree. There is there is that interconnectedness. There is that that web between us that connects all of us. But that's that's a deeper that's a deeper part to the roots to this world tree is those relationships between us. The roots run deep into the lower world. The branches, our, our ability to reach into the upper worlds, our, our ability to open and expand our minds, reach far into the upper world. This type of relationship provides us humans a technology with which to remember that we are all a part of the same tree. So we have that recognition. We hope that we have that recognition. We're moving towards that recognition. The archetype of your spirit kin, the representation of the world tree, they all enable us to connect to that deep power. They remind us that the power lives within us. And again, there is that web. There is that place of all interconnectedness. The relationship to your spirit kin is as personal and as private as the conversations with your best friend, as personal and private as the thoughts you allow to float when you reach into that deep place of stillness in meditation. We access the spirit through a multitude of ways asking you to consider the concept of a spirit kin or a helping spirit as an archetype may be a stretch if you have only considered the construct of archetypes in the psychological manner of explanation of the human psyche. They are much deeper than that. If we move through many of the myths and many of the stories, not only from our grandmothers and our grandfathers, but from the ancestors who have long departed us, we can see the relationship between the spirit kin and the humans. The totem is the perfect example. The totem is the people who are born from the lineage of the totem clan, the clan of the bear, to the clan of the coyote, to the clan of the kangaroo, all of the totems, they're very different from the power animal, but I know I've spoken to that before. First time listener, I'll just give you a sneak peek. A totem is the spirit, the animal that you are genetically, spiritually, socially, matrifocally, patrifocally connected to. It is your brother, your sister, your father, your mother. Power animal 
is an animal that can come and go. It is an animal you form a relationship with, but you do not have an ancestral lineage connection to. You are not born from. Your stories do not take you to the born from. That is the true difference between the power animal and the totem. The relationship between the spirit kin grows and the love that I have experienced with my spirit kin has been nourishing, fulfilling, and incredibly awakening. The opportunity to feel great love in the middle world and the opportunity in the mundane world and the opportunity to experience love in the spirit world and in the sacred world, they are different and they are equally invaluable to the awakening and to the health of the soul. To abandon the urban mentality, to abandon the family lore that you are not connected to nature, to the overculture lore that you are spiritually connected to some being up in the sky or some being somewhere else and not really connected to this earth, I am grateful that you can pass through those limited understandings and recognize there is deep relationship and important relationship to be had to the world around you. The deeper we connect with the world around us, here's the you know, environmental plug, we certainly have a greater connection and love for the earth. If we don't love something, we're not going to fight for it. That has been my experience as an activist, as a writer, as a person who loves to harass her government officials because that's important for me. I don't know if it would have been as important for me if I hadn't lived so deeply in the spirit world. If I hadn't lived so deeply in the spirit world and recognized the true value of freedom of every single sentient being, alive being in the world, I don't know if I would have had the courage to fight so strongly and for so long in this world. Our voices in this world are invaluable to speak the language of spirit, to impart and impass the messages, the lessons, the love, the deep wisdom, the mystery, the chaos, all of those things, plus a myriad of other words I did not include, that is the benefit of relationship with your spirit kin. That is parts of the benefit of working diligently in a spiritual path or on a spiritual journey. I know that each one of us learns incredibly different. I know each one of us processes information differently. I know each one of us has our own destiny and our own path to find and to follow. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your ear. I thank you for listening to my meandering thoughts on the spirit kin as an archetype to active imagination, to the depth of spirit, and to recognize that in this time of hope and great change that we can connect to the spirits that have supported us and to take our message of hope further out, to take our message of change further out and engage not only the physical body, and that is more important, I think, than almost anything in the entire world, but also to give yourself support from the spirit world. If you are tracking racism, if you are tracking hope, if you are tracking a new way of existing in a world that we pray has inevitable change ahead of it, good change, only emboldens us, empowers us, and strengthens us if we can find our relationship to the spirit world and our grounding in the spirit world to strengthen our resolve, our bodies, our minds, and our voices in this world, in the 3D reality that we live in, in this ordinary reality. 
the ordinary reality and the non-ordinary reality, remember that the space between the two is as thin as a maple leaf. And that is my last Canadian quote for the evening. Until next time, hold yourself and the people that you love close. If you don't have a human in your house and you have a pet, hold that pet close. If you don't have a human or a pet in your house, for heaven's sakes, please hug someone. And know that your heart is just as precious, just as wide, just as open, just as important, just as valuable, and just as beautiful as every other heart that you look at. Don't let the critical voice at this time of great change, in this time of such hope with your spiritual relationship, don't let the critical voice talk you out of the sacred. Don't. You're far too important. Your voices and your spirits are needed now. We are at such a precipice. Again, okay, this is my final goodbye. All right, until next time. <laughs> I truly love you all. I truly appreciate your thoughts and uh, that you send to me, your ideas that you send to me. I thank you for spending your time. I know it's valuable and precious. Sayonata. Thank you again for joining us here on the Shaman's Way podcast. If you have any questions, would like to make a request for a future episode, or if you're looking for other shamanic resources, including free drumming tracks, please visit us at shamansway.net. Until the next episode, be well, everyone.